Isn't God good? I think that ought to be our open opening thought as we get into our study. For tonight, we've been talking about the prosperity gospel and the subject really uh, of giving as we get to the second half of that prosperity gospel. And does God give you um, money in exchange for your giving money to the church? Which would kind of lead you to think, oh, why wouldn't he just give the money to the church, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, but we've talked about that. We've dealt really with all of the pros- prosperity gospel arguments. We've responded to all of them. Um, but it, it seems to me that, this, that there is something unanswered uh, after we've, in my opinion, defeated all of those concepts. The idea that you will get something in return for giving to a church is just so foreign to Scripture that I think we've pretty well handled that, that subject. Um, but one of the problems that I mentioned last week is that when you speak to most Christians, and don't feel bad if you find yourself in this category, because like I said, most Christians do, even myself, just a you know, relatively few years ago, um, if you were to ask me what the Bible says about giving, there'd be two things that came to the top of my head. It would be, well, God promises to take care of my finances as long as I give a tithe to him. He commands me to give a tithe, and if I do, he'll take care of my financial situation. Well, that's for, for most Christians, that's, you know, we don't think about it much. And the, one of the reasons we don't think about it is pastors don't want to preach about it. And you can understand why. Because <laughs> they're going to tell you, well, okay, not every pastor, but some pastors... Um, have been told, look, the tithe is a command from God, and you have to preach it, or you have to to affirm it. And then they go to the Bible, and they say, I don't know where to affirm this from. And so now they're going to stand up in front of their congregation and tell them to do something that's not actually commanded in the Bible, and it's going to look like they're doing it for wrong reasons, right, trying to be greedy. So pastors, understandably, just stay away from the subject altogether. Um, so I get it. And that, what that produces in the hearts of most Christians is a misunderstanding about giving. They just never hear it talked about. They never hear it, it carefully examined from the Scripture. And um, what it means is that all we know usually is I have to pay the tithe, and if I do, God will bless my, my finances. And since for the last couple of weeks I've sort of torn those two ideas apart, biblically speaking, um, not trying to pad the argument. I just feel like that's what we've done. I think we've carefully shown that. Um, then what we leave people with is, well, I guess there is no command to give, and I guess there is no motive for giving. And there is a much greater motive for giving in the Bible. It's just not that you're going to get money back. There's a much great, many greater motives uh, than that. And there is a command to give in the Bible. It's just not a command to give 10%. Uh, to the church. There is certainly a command to give. And uh, someone says, how much? Now you're asking the wrong question. But we will answer that question by the time we're done, God willing. But um, the, what we've done, let me just very quickly recap what we did last week. We talked about what the tithe was in the Old Testament. Since it's not mentioned in the New Testament, except in relation to the Pharisees who were not believers and were not paying tithe to the church. Um, so we said, what was this tithe thing in the Old Testament? And we recognized that the tithe was, was a specific command to specific people for a specific purpose. The specific people was the nation of Israel. The specific purpose was to uh, provide for the Levites and for the orphans and the widows. And the specific command was to, to bring 33 and a third percent of your income um, every year to either to Jerusalem, 20% of it went to Jerusalem, Uh, half of that was for you and Levites around you and your family and your employees and everything to feast on and on the feast days. 10% of your income was for that. Another 10% was to give to the priests in Jerusalem for them to take care of themselves. And then every three years, you had to take another 10% and give it to your local town, your local um, government, your local city. And they would take those tithes, and they would be distributed to the Levites in your local city, 
and to the widows and orphans in your local town. And so 33 and a third percent, and it was basically what it was given to was essentially like our taxes today. That's what the tithe was. So it was a specific command to a specific people for a specific purpose, and the command, the people, and the purpose do not apply today. So obviously it would be, it would just, just, it just doesn't make any sense to try to claim that this is a command to the church since it's never listed as a command to the church. And even if you took the command from the Old Testament and tried to apply it to the church, you couldn't because it's a specific command for specific people for a specific time. I say that because there was one section in my notes that I didn't get to, and I wanted to mention this very quickly before we get to what does the Bible say about giving. Because the Bible does command us to give, and it does command us to give to a couple different causes, a couple different purposes, and it gives us the reasons why we should give. And they're much greater reasons than getting money back, and they are much um, a, great, a much greater calling than you have to give 10%. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to mention the first fruits in the Old Testament, just very briefly, because often people um, confuse tithe and first fruits. They believe, oh, see, when I tithe, I should be the f- it should be the first thing I pay out of my tithe is, uh, is you know, to the church, 10% to the church, out of my ink, out of my paycheck. I, first, I set aside the tithe because it's supposed to be first fruits. Those are two different uh, offerings in the Old Testament. There's the tithe and the first fruits are two different things. Um, I are just mentioned and recapped the tithe to you. The first fruit offering, there was a couple different first fruit offerings. They were often connected with the tithe, but they're not the same thing as the tithe. Let me give you just very quickly the first fruit offerings. So there was the first of all living things, that was to be given to the service of God or else redeemed back to the giver. So um, if you had a, your firstborn son was to be God's, well, since only the Levites could serve in the temple, if you weren't a Levite, um, then you would redeem your son back. If you were a Levite, he's already going to serve in the temple. You don't have to redeem him back, right? But uh, if you weren't a Levite, you would have to redeem your son back. You bring an offering to make up for the fact that you're going to keep your son. Um and that's where uh, Samuel, right, the firstborn of Hannah, was given to the Lord rather than re- being redeemed back. Um, and so that, that's what was going on there in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now, um, that, so that was the first, if you had a firstborn, the firstborn lamb of, of his mother, the firstborn cattle, cow, whatever, you know, all the firstborns had to either be sacrificed, given to the priests, or they had to be redeemed back. That wasn't a 10%, that wasn't a tithe, that was a firstborn offering, uh, first, and it's considered a first fruits. Now, also the first fruit of grain, wine, oil, and fleece. Now, there's, those are the four things that had to be uh, brought as first fruits. These things, grain, wine, oil, and fleece, was to be given to the priests. Now, it's interesting, in this, just in, if you're taking notes, that first one I mentioned, the firstborn um, first fruit, is Exodus 13, 12 through 13, and Exodus 22, 29 through 30. Now, the first fruit of grain, wine, oil, and fleece is mentioned in Deuteronomy 18, 4, and Numbers 18, 12. And the interesting thing about this command is that there's no amount given. It's just when you cut the flock, you know, when you get the fleece from the flock, some of it you give to the priests. How much? Some wait a minute, I need something specific. No, just some. Why? Well, because what you're doing is you're acknowledging that this is from God, and God's the one who gave you a harvest of fleece or a harvest of grain. And so you give it based on how grateful you are to God for that harvest, but you give something because you have to acknowledge that it's God's. In some cases, in in fact, the, the third first fruit offering was actually something that they would do where they would actually um, take and wave, when they would eat a piece, a loaf of bread, they would take the first, tear off a piece and wave it before the Lord and then eat it. And all it was is they called it a first fruit offering, but it wasn't going, they were keeping it, they were eating it. They were just acknowledging this is God's because it was all from him before they eat the first bite. And so this is what a first fruit offering is. So just, you know, there's more to talk about on that. You can check out Exodus 34, 26, which is probably talking about that kind of first fruit offering. Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. Leviticus 23, 17. 
And then Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 4 was the, when they first got to the land of Canaan, they were to offer a first fruit offering of the first harvest they got in the land of Canaan. Um, so those are things uh, for your own personal study. Just uh, to clarify, first fruits, tithe, two totally different things. Um, now let's go on to what the Bible actually does say to the church. Now, I, I gave that because I resigned myself to cutting this into two pieces already. So I have no, no um, uh, delusion that we're going to finish the whole thing. But there's, let me just give you an overview of the things I want to cover here. What does the Bible say about giving to the church? I want to start by saying, what are the things that money was used for in the early church? Like, what is the pattern of the early church, and is there any command to support certain things? And there are three things. One of them is kind of like a very generic thing, but we'll get to that. Uh, two of them are very specific. There are three categories in which um, our money is supposed to be used for. Um, now, that doesn't mean you couldn't also pay a bill or something, you know, pay an electric bill or something, but it, they didn't have electric bills back then, right? So there's categories that we find in the New Testament. That's what I want to cover today. And then next, not next week, because we have our prayer hour. So two weeks from now, we would get into the final question, which is, how do we, if we're not telling people God commands you to give 10%, and we're not telling people if you'll give, you'll get money back, then how do we convince them to give? And uh, it, if you were here for the last couple um, weeks, you know, well, that's kind of a shallow question. It is, but it's a, it's a natural question if you haven't studied um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, which gives you all the answers. But we'll go through and we'll actually list those answers from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Why is it that we do give? What is the thing that, that calls us to give? What are the things that we, the reasons why we should not give, the, the wrong reasons to give and the right reasons to give? Um, so let's talk about what we should give. Obviously, if there are three things that we're supposed to be supporting with money, then there's an insistence that we give, right? There is a command of God to give because these three things have to be supported. So let's talk about them. We'll start with this one. This seems to be a little bit obvious. And that is, to, we, the, there is a command in the New Testament to the church to support those who serve the church, especially in pastoral leadership, but not limited to pastoral leadership. So let's see what it has to say about this. First, let's go to Luke chapter 8, if you would. Matthew, Mark, Luke, right? If you, <laughs> in case you needed to know that. That's just me speaking what comes to my head when I'm finding the book, books, I, I have to repeat them. Um, Luke chapter 8, this is, uh, uh, we're talking about the instruction to the church to take care of, financially take care of, those who minister to the church, especially pastorally. Now let's define that. Pastorally, in the Bible, the word pastor means a shepherd, somebody who feeds the flock. Now we've taken that word and we've made it equal to probably what the what the New Testament would use the word bishop, right? The overseer of the church. And that's fine because bishops should also be shepherds. <laughs> so it's fine to call them pastors. Um, and that's just sort of what we do. But notice that pastor really describes a specific part of the ministry of the bishop, the overseer, and that is to feed the flock. So there's others who might come along and help to feed the flock, um, and uh, in this case, those who are giving of their time and effort and energy, um, rather than providing for themselves, uh, they're giving that up so that they can minister to the church, should then be provided for by the church. And we can see this in Luke chapter 8. It's a pattern that, that the Lord set. That's the first point I want to give you. In Luke chapter 8, verse 3, it talks about Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others. These are women which followed Christ. And it says, which ministered unto him of their substance. So as Christ and the apostles went around ministering, how did they survive for three and a half years? What, what was this bag that Judas had? How, how did he get any money in the bag? Well, it's because people who were being ministered to by Christ and the apostles were supporting him. They were keeping him afloat. And so the apostles continued that concept into the New Testament church. It was of course, Christ 
had founded the church, right? This was the founding of the church with Christ and the apostles. You say, well, it didn't actually start until Pentecost. I don't care, okay? <laughs> That's not the point, all right? Um, so anyway, let's move on before I get in trouble. Uh, so that's a, that's a pattern that, that Christ began. If you look at Luke chapter 9, you see that he continues that in verse 3 and 4 when he sends the 12 apostles out to minister. It says this, He said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither stays nor script, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. What are they going to do? Well, when you go to a city, somebody's going to provide for you. And whatsoever how she enter into their abide and thence depart. Okay? You're ministering to them. I will put it on someone's heart to take care of you. Um, chapter 10, Christ sends out 72 of his disciples. He says the same thing to them in verses 4 through 7. Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes, and salute no man by the way, and to what, whatsoever house she enter in, enter, first say, Peace be to this house, and if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. Now, there's a lot more going on in that passage. We'll talk about it in our, in our Luke series when we get there. But for now, let's just recognize that that the pattern that Christ set with his apostles was the ministers should be cared for by those who are being ministered to. And that's a, that's a pattern that the church continued. Let's look at the early church pattern, if you will. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll be in 1 Timothy a lot because uh, for this section. Because in 1 Timothy, we do find an order that Paul is giving him, the young Timothy, the young pastor Timothy, as to how he's to order the church, how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God is what, is what Paul said to him. And so we'll find a lot of like details about church polity and order in 1 Timothy. I, as a pastor, I'm very enriched whenever I uh, set aside time to study the book of 1 Timothy. Um, okay, 1 Timothy chapter 3, this is the orders to, the, uh, to, to Timothy about choosing men for the office of a bishop. He's going to ordain someone for the office of a bishop. Then it says this, uh, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre. We can stop there for the point of our study. What that means is he's not trying to just get rich. He's not a greedy person. He's not taking the job for greedy gain. He's not looking for underhanded, corrupt, you know, he's not going to try to embezzle money from the church. He's not there for the money. If he's not there for the money, then there must be some money involved in caring for him, right? So that's, that's implied. Now, if you look a little bit further, this is interesting. Um, look at what it says in verse 8. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy, a filthy lucre. Why? Look, at, we have to understand that in the first century, it wasn't like people had enough money in their bank account to buy food for years. Most of us have enough money in our bank account to buy food for at least months, if not weeks, I mean, if not years, or at least weeks, if not months or years, right? Because we just have, we want to have extra, we want to have money to, you know, we don't have to worry about tomorrow's food. Um, but for them, often it was a daily struggle to, to get food, right? I want to make sure I can eat today, so I've got to make sure I've got enough money um, to, this week to, to buy some food for next week. Now, um, some newlyweds might have might identify with that uh, <laughs> that extreme day to day poverty, but for the most part in America, that's not you know something we have to worry about. Um, it was for them. So, for a deacon uh, to give up, uh, and in many of these churches, they were giving up massive amounts of time to administer um, things and and take care of issues, especially concerning uh, taking care of the poor, which we'll talk about later. Um, this was something that sometimes they would actually pay them to do it because they needed to be paid in order to do it. Um, for instance, there's a, a letter of an early church father, Ignatius of Antioch, in uh, about 10 years after John the Apostle died, in about 107 or so <clears throat> AD. And he writes a letter 
to, I forget which church it was, he wrote to seven different church, seven letters, one of them wasn't to a church, it was to a pastor, and in one of the letters he said, send a deacon from your church to take this letter over to that church over there. Well, how could he do that? I mean, who's going who's gonna to take care of the deacon if he just up and leaves his job and runs over there and is a letter boy? Well, that's the types of things deacons did. They were servants of the church, anything the church needed, they would do it, so often they were paid. <clears throat> And I don't think that's anything. There's anything wrong with that. If in, even in today, if a deacon were not able to do the job of a deacon without, and understand, deacon means servant. So anybody who really was employed by the church, like we have people who are employed by the church, um, would sometimes be referred to just as a servant of the church. Even if they're not in the official office of deacon, they might use the word servant or deacon for that person. That's why some people have said, well, there's deaconesses, you know. Well, they probably weren't in that office of, of leadership deacon, but they there might have been ladies who served the church, then they would, might also get that name deacon, even though it's not the office of deacon. So a, a bigger conversation. But the point is that sometimes deacons did receive money, otherwise they couldn't have taken the job being greedy of filthy lucre. So that's interesting. So it's not just limited to pastoral leadership, but anyone who has to who is unable to provide for themselves because of the ministry they're providing to the church should be provided for by the church. You see the same thing if you want to just jot it down. Titus chapter 1, verse 7, and 1 Peter 5, 2, which also tells us that pastoral leadership in the church, elders, should not be taking the job for the money, which means they must be getting paid something. Now, here's some arguments that Paul made for this as well. In 1 Corinthians 9... Um, he made this argument, and this is probably the strongest and clearest um, argument for this. You might say, well, maybe just the pastors were, were paid sometimes. Well, that's not the argument Paul made. He seems to very much um, believe that the, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so he's right, that the pattern the Lord set with his disciples was continued to the church. In 1 Corinthians 9, it says this, "'Am I not an apostle?' Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord, and yet not my work in the Lord? Are, are not ye my work in the Lord? Now, this is an important point that he's making. He says, he says, I've produced the church in Corinth. I mean, he came, he planted the church, he gave the gospel, he won them to Christ, he started the church. Um, the church wouldn't exist if he hadn't gone out and planted it. So he says, aren't you my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. He says, look, if others don't believe I'm an apostle, surely you've got to believe. <laughs> uh, mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife? By the way, apostles were not celibate, except perhaps Paul. He may have been, but they weren't required to be. As well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. That's Peter. Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Uh, couldn't we just not do this work if we wanted to? <clears throat> who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? He says, look, I planted the church. I, I did all this work. And notice what he's saying. Verse 8, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law also the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. By the way, Deuteronomy 25, 4, if you want to jot that down. That's where that command is. Doth God take care for the oxen? Now, this, this could be a whole study right here. The fact that Paul is taking an Old Testament law that said that they're not to muzzle oxen if they're treading out corn. The idea is the the oxen would, you know, go around in a circle and he'd be attached to the mill or whatever and he'd be treading out the corn. And so uh, the grain would be flying in the air and it would be settling down. And the ox, as he's going around in the circle, would often take a bite out of what's going through the air. He's hungry. He's doing the work. Doesn't he at least deserve it? So God said, you're not to muzzle that ox. Now, Paul looks at that passage and he says, is this really about God? caring about cows, oxen, you know? Or is God giving us a principle here? Now, I love that, that in the law, 
we see principles about the character of God, where even if the law is not is for Israel, not for us, the principle about the character of God is still expressed through that law. What a brilliant way to read the Old Testament law. But at any, at any rate, Paul says, isn't that really just showing us the character of God, where if, if somebody like Paul goes and works and gives of his time and, and, and sacrifices to plant a church, shouldn't that church help take care of his needs? And of course, Paul's answer is yes, that's obviously the desire of God. So there we go. Let's continue. I, I have, I've listed that it goes through 14, so let's continue. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes. And then he concludes, for our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Now, we'll talk in a moment. Paul is not greedy. He's already said you shouldn't be doing this if you're greedy, right? That's very clear. And we'll, we'll see in a moment how Paul is not saying this for greedy purposes. He's just saying, isn't this a basic principle that the people who are out there not working so that they can minister to you should the needs that they are not being met since they're not make, working a job should be met by those who they're ministering to. Um, and so it's a basic principle that I think is very clear. Uh, verse 12, if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. So this is actually part of his case that he is an apostle. He's saying, I could have asked you to support me because I did sacrifice a lot to plant your church. And I haven't asked you to support me. He says, we do not use this power, but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. I really was afraid it would hinder the gospel of Christ to let you guys know that I was in need of things. So I didn't ask you. I didn't ask you for it. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live off the things of the temple? Now he's using the priests as an example. He's saying, don't they live off of what's given to the temple? So shouldn't those who minister in the church also live off of what's given to the church. That's a, that's a good analogy, right? Um, let's, reach, uh, let's see, verse 13. Uh, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel, meaning the results of their work should produce um, those things that they need to care for their, their, their needs. Now let's follow Paul's continuing continued argument into 2 Corinthians. If you go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you'll see that he continues this argument, and we'll pick it up in verse 7. <clears throat> have I committed an offense in abasing myself that I might be exalted, because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? So he's asking this question, have I done something wrong by not asking you to care for my needs? and just preaching the gospel freely. Um, I robbed, he says, here's the reason why I might have done something wrong. I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. Meaning other churches were providing me what I needed to survive, and I was ministering to you. Shouldn't it have been you <laughs> providing the things I needed to survive rather than me robbing, he's say, using that term to show them how wrong it really was that he was getting this money from other churches when he should have been getting it from them. And that kind of speaks to that whole idea that missionaries should seek to be self-supporting. They should seek to build a church that then supports itself. It should be the goal of a missionary. Um, but he says, look, it really would be right once you're established to take care of me while I'm ministering to you. Um, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, meaning I, I had a need for something, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so, I, so will I keep myself. So he had the right to just say, oh, I didn't want anything from you because I didn't want to be a burden to you. Uh, but he's bringing this really as a condemnation against them because they are constantly arguing in the church of Corinth over whether Paul really is an apostle, whether we really have to listen to him. Why? Because the church of Corinth was rather carnal, and Paul wrote to them about all the things they did wrong. And so then some people didn't want to listen to him and said, well, he's not an apostle, we don't have to listen to him. right? So in order to keep 
that out of the issue when he came. He didn't ask for money. He was supported by others. He says, verse 10, as a truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. I guess I didn't need to read that verse. All right, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is probably the clearest description. Um, it is just very, very abundant. Although we've seen it very clearly, the argument made by Paul. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. Now he takes this, less than anybody say, well, that's just the apostles. Just the apostles need to be provided for by the church. Look what it says in verse 17. And 1 Timothy chapter 5, we're going to spend some time on, <laughs> oh man, maybe we're going to do two more weeks on this, because we'll, we'll talk about the widows that are widows indeed, also mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 5. By the way, praise the Lord that we as a church now have a deacon's fund to care for people like that. Um, so let, we'll talk about that, uh, not next week, in the next couple weeks. But let's, let's look at, uh, just in closing here, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. It says this, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Now, that word honor is a word that has to do with value. Um, you can see it uh, in verse 3, I believe. Yeah, honor widows that are widows indeed. What he means by that is care for them. See them as valuable enough to give them a stipend to help them survive right? So that's what he's saying here. He's in the same context of caring for the widows. He says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Now remember, again, that Paul is, in a, is operating in a patriarchal sort of society, a um, you are the patriarch and I, you do something for me and now I owe you service in return because of what you've done for me. And so there's sort of this exchange idea that you might be given a gift, but now there's an expectation that you're going to, you know, it's not, gifts aren't just free. I mean, look, I gave you a gift and that's yours. You can keep it. But now I expect when I need something, you're going to be there to meet my need because now we're friends. Now we're in a, we're in a deal, you know, I, I made you an offer you can't refuse, you know, that kind of a mentality. And that was just normal for them. It wasn't, didn't seem strange at all. So now he's saying, honor the elders that rule well. Let them be counted worthy of double honor. So what he's saying is, if they've ministered to you well, then you should feel a desire to recompense to them doubly what you would feel when anyone else does something for you. Because they're ministering to you the gospel, and that's doubly more important than anything else, right? So, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, this is interesting because elders would be a sort of a general title that could refer to um, any area of church leadership in, in those days, and they would usually have a bishop who would sort of oversee all the elders. It's not really the type of church um, structure that we have today, but it was modeled after the synagogue um, back in those times. So um, the Bible never commands us. We have to have it exactly the way that um, the church is. As a matter of fact, we know for a fact that in uh, churches like in the Church of Rome in the first century, there were multiple elders and no bishop. And then in other churches, it was one bishop who oversaw it. In most churches, in fact, there was one primary guy, and then there were other leaders underneath him. And they were usually, the, uh, all the leaders could be called elders, but the one guy was the bishop. And we know that from uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, when the letters are written to the angel, which refers probably to the bishop of all of these of each of these individual churches. The point is that um, church government doesn't always have to be all the same. Uh, in America, we tend to model our church government a little bit more like our government, because that's what we're used to in government, right? I mean, we, we vote and do more, a little bit more um, uh, electoral things, you know, we Robert's Rules of Orders and all that kind of stuff. Those aren't requirements in the Bible. We just, that works for us. It's what our culture is. It's certainly fine. Um, at any rate, here he's saying, let the elders, the ones... He says, especially those that labor in the word and doctrine. He says, listen, if they are giving their time to study the scripture, that's taking a lot of time. That's a lot of effort. And it's the most valuable type of leader that you have in the church. I mean, they're all valuable, but my goodness, the ones that labor in the word and doctrine are very important. So let them be considered worthy of double what you would give anyone for any other service that they do for you. Verse 18, again, he brings that same scripture. The scripture saith, 
that thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So I think, um, I didn't expect it to take up all of our time on this one point, but I think we've made the point, and we've done, we've done it by uh, actually dealing with all the passages in Scripture that make this clear. And that is that one of the areas that clearly the church is responsible to care for is for those who minister to the church. This is why when we have someone come and minister to us the word, if we have a missionary come and stop in and preach for us, what do we do? We give him, we guarantee that we're going to give him a love offering. Uh, why? Because he's ministered to us the word. That, that's what we're supposed to do. Shouldn't, shouldn't we provide for him since he has provided an even much more valuable thing than money to us? And so that is, that is the pattern that is thoroughly biblical and right for us to do. Uh, now, I'll give you the other two categories, and we'll talk about them in the next couple weeks. Um, so the second category is to care for the poor, uh, but there's qualifications to that. It's not just all the poor of the world. It's not telling us to have soup kitchens. We can do that, right? That's not the command. The command is to care for the poor of the church who we can determine for sure need to be cared for. Not, we're spe- specifically not to care for those who caring for them would cause them to be lazy, busybodies, and uh, when they could be out working and caring for themselves. So we'll talk about that um, in a couple of weeks. And then the final one will be gospel endeavors. Uh, Jesus made this pretty clear to us. And I think this would pretty well uh, cover missions and missionary works. Um, but we'll talk about that as well, maybe in two weeks. And then, of course, we'll get to what is, what, why are we to give and why are we not to give? What are the right motives and wrong motives to give? And what are, what are the right amounts to give? You know, we'll ask that question. Uh, we won't give you specifics, though. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. We'll give you the principles that God that God gives us. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll close there. Um, two weeks from now, we'll pick it up, um, God willing, from that, from that point, and we'll see how far we get next time. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, what a, what a great privilege it is to be part of the family of God, to be part of a local church, uh, to know that when we give to our local church, the, the funds are being used for the furtherance of the gospel. What a great privilege this is. We thank you that you have Um, commanded us to, as a church, provide for certain things. And we pray that as as you enable us, that we would have a part in that, but personally, by giving to the common funds that are given out to these endeavors. Lord, we thank you for those who have ministered to us. Perhaps, um, Perhaps we can think of of opportunities in the past where we've been able to provide for those who minister to us and how how thrilling it is to know that we can give back to those who have given so much to us and lord we we thank you for them and for their faithfulness to you lord we thank you for the missionary who'll be here in a few weeks nick stelzik we pray that you'd prepare his heart and we look forward to giving back to him after he ministers to us and lord in all of these things as we consider this may we, may it be truly with the purest of heart and the purest of motives, not just to find exactly what you say in your word, but also to really joy and rejoice in that glorious opportunity that we have to take what you've given to us and give it back to you. What a great thing that is. We thank you for it. Pray that you give us a good day and give us safety as we head home. We pray these things in Jesus' name.